Okay, our next speaker today is um, Melissa Missy Showers. She is with Lockheed Martin. She's gonna be talking to us about fusion energy. Uh, Missy studied mechanical engineering with a focus in, in energy and sustainability at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. After finishing her undergraduate degree, she worked for a year at a consulting firm specializing in the electricity sector, working on projects ranging from approving the construction of a new power plant to monitoring energy auctions to ensure power gets to your outlets at home. She returned to school to get her PhD in energy science and engineering at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where she specialized in nuclear fusion projects. After graduating, she joined Lockheed Martin Skunk Works and works in their revolutionary technologies program on various projects, including materials research, energy efficiency, biomimicry, and plasma technologies. So please welcome Melissa Missy Showers. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I, I apologize, my um, video is being a little wonky, um, but uh, I will go ahead and uh, show my slides. You probably won't be interested in just watching my face anyway, because hopefully you'll be looking at the presentation. All right, so am I in full screen now or no? It's just coming up. My mouse disappeared. Okay, here we go. So we're nice. seeing your uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so let's go from the beginning. So are we now, hold on, it should be going full screen? Yep, looks good. Solid. All right, so um, as Kathy said, I'm going to be uh, talking to you all about uh, nuclear fusion energy. Um, so just very quickly to go over the difference between nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. So nuclear, when someone says nuclear energy or like a nuclear power plant currently, they're usually talking about nuclear fission. Um, this is what has, is powering our standard nuclear reactors at this point, and it is effectively taking heavier atoms and splitting them. Where nuclear fusion does the opposite. We're taking very light atoms and we're fusing them together to make slightly heavier atoms. That's, that's the core difference here. Um, something I do wanna point out though, before we get a little bit uh, too far into the details is uh, what, um, what nuclear fusion might eventually be used for or its, its intended purpose currently is to basically be replacing um, um, our baseload energy generation. So providing power to the grid. And this little uh, schematic here shows the basic method of generating um, power. So basically we take some kind, any kind of fuel source um, and burn it to generate heat. So that can be your nuclear fission, hopefully nuclear fusion. That can also be burning coal. That could be burning natural gas, um, anything along those lines. As long as it can provide some kind of heat that will um, effectively be used to boil water to create steam to be able to drive a turbine and then that will create electricity. So that's, that's the core of it. So uh, you can, in theory, replace this uh, the heat source with any kind of fuel that could get decently hot. Um, and that's hopefully what we are going to be using uh, nuclear fusion for. So the most common nuclear fusion reactor is um, reaction um, uses two, um, um, uh, uses deuterium and tritium. So they are um, technically uh, hydrogen atoms that either have an additional uh, neutron, um, one or two additional neutrons. And nuclear fusion is actually the same type of reaction that occurs in our sun. Um, and also if you ever see uh, like lightning, for example, that's also fusion. So as I mentioned, we have uh, tritium and deuterium. So D and T, um, if anyone's looked at uh, anything really um, up on nuclear fusion before, that's what you've probably seen or heard of something called like a DT reaction, and that's what they mean. So in the process of fusing deuterium and tritium together, which you uh, can only do if you have sufficient heat and sufficient um, pressure, uh, eventually you are able to fuse those two together. And when they combine to create helium, which is the natural byproduct, um, it releases quite a bit of energy, significantly more, especially per mass than any other fuel source that we currently have. 
Um, one of the really nice things about nuclear fusion is as helium is its byproduct, that's it's it's sustainable. We don't have to worry about, for example, any kind of long-term radioactive material that we might need to um, be concerned with uh, if we're looking at, for example, working with like uranium or plutonium, which is a common fuel source for nuclear fission reactions. Um, the, the key component that we do have here is the, this little neutron that comes off of the reaction. And that is the, the little component that will end up carrying all the heat. So as long as we can capture the heat generated, um, carried through these neutrons, then that is our, our heat source. So there's two ty main types of nuclear fusion that are, are they're kind of the lead in this industry. There's inertial confinement fusion and magnetic confinement fusion. Inertial confinement is basically it's confined by its, its own mass, for lack of a better term. Um, what will happen is that it's so the, we'll take a little bit of fuel, a, a deuterium tritium fuel, uh, heat it up really, uh, really high. And then it, the, um, once it gets to a, a certain, um, certain heat, it'll actually uh, compress. And then uh, that com compression provides the, uh, the pressure and, and heat needed for it to actually fuse itself. And then you, you have your fusion, um, fusion event. Whereas magnetic confinement fusion takes advantage of the fact that we have ionized particles. Um, so particles that either have a positive or negative charge associated with them. And once they are positive or negatively charged, you can actually control them using magnets and electric fields. So they run based on that concept instead. So inertial confinement fusion, I, I gave a, a quick overview just now, but to give you an idea of, of how small these little pellets actually are when you're attempting to do a, a inertial confinement reaction, we're talking something that's maybe one point, um, 1700 microns in uh, radius. It's a very small, um, small little thing. Uh, if you look in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, you see this uh, um, little design is called a whole room. And each of these little, um, little strands that you see down here are only about the width of a human hair. They're very, very fine. And they're actually used to help confine um, the uh, inertial confinement fusion reaction. So one of the machines that has been designed to do an inertial confinement fusion reaction is the Z machine at Sandia National Labs. This is kind of like an overview of um, what that machine actually looks like. And if you look in the corner here with a circle on the, the red arrow, that's actually a door for scale. So these, uh, these inertial confinement devices are actually ex can be extraordinarily large um, and, and very difficult to, to construct. Some quick facts, for example, about that uh, Z machine. Um, it uh, can have a peak electrical power of over 80 gigawatts. But I think what um, the, the most impression, uh, impressive thing is that it actually has a compressive speed of over 300,000 miles an hour. So that's the equivalent of flying from like New York to LA in like well less than a second. Um, so this compression event happens extraordinarily fast. Um, here's a fun picture of uh, what, sometimes what can happen in the Z machine as they're, they're turning it on to attempt to have a uh, ignition reaction. All these little spidery veins that you can see through here is actually ionized air or lightning. Um, so that you're actually kind of just sh showing throughout the, um, the uh, entire machine. They've, they, they have a cover over this, so it's, it's nice and safe, but uh, they, they did get a picture of an event uncovered, which was pretty cool. Um, magnetic confinement fusion is what I am uh, where my research has primarily laid. Um, there are two main types of magnetic confinement devices. One is called a tokamak, uh, and the other one is called a stellarator. Um, these two designs are are very both very complicated and and interesting. The a, a tokamak, if you take a cross section of it, kind of looks like a donut. Um, Stellarator is just an engineering mess. They have both have their pros and cons. A Stellarator is from an engineering standpoint, the actual construction of this machine is significantly, significantly harder than building a tokamak. However, the way it is construction uh, constructed allows a more stable um, plasma and nuclear, um, makes it a little bit more stable and a little bit easier to actually do the plasma 
physics that are required to do nuclear fusion reactions. Whereas a tokamak from an engineering standpoint, it's a lot easier to construct, but in general, the plasma that's generated within the machine tends to be not quite as happy. Now, one of the main, the most popular um, devices that are being built right now in, in terms of nuclear, the nuclear fusion industry is ITER, is a multinational um, effort, collaboration across uh, seven different countries. And it's been in construction or under, uh, under development, if you will, for well over 35 years at this point. Um, the overall goal for this is to um, achieve, hopefully at some point, a, a Q of 10, which is basically for every unit of power you put in, you get uh, 10 units of power out. So in, in this concept, you'd actually be creating not necessarily like exactly creating energy, but you would have a significantly higher efficiency of, um, of that heat production in comparison to your um, standard, maybe coal fired power plant, for example. Um, so this machine is actually just to demonstrate um, the ability to have a commercial sized nuclear fusion reactor that could in theory go onto the electric grid. Um, and can and start to produce electricity. Though ITER itself is not designed to ever go onto the grid, it is simply designed to do, be that large proof of concept. It's just a 35 plus year old proof of concept. We're still working on it. Um, some important things that we're testing all different kinds of um, different um, critical engineering systems that are going to be required to be able to have a nuclear fusion power plant of this scale. Um, so if you look in the bottom uh, right-hand corner here, you'll see that steam generator uh, turbine uh, kind of design here. So this, is, this goes back to that first diagram that I showed you where we just need the heat, then we can turn water into steam, turn a turbine, create electricity. But that's only part of what they're going to need to be concerned with where um, some other things besides just fueling the reactor, you also need to be concerned with. Um, there's a, a, a breeding effort where you're actually trying to um, use another um, component called lithium to actually create more tritium as the reaction's going on. So in theory, if we get it right, this um, reaction can not only create a, a lot of additional heat to create electricity, but in theory, it could be used to produce its own fuel. So adding another component to its sustainability. Um, just some quick facts about the machine itself. It's going to be very large, <laughs> the total weight of over uh, 23,000 tons, well over 100,000 kilometers of magnets, um, uh, plasma temperature of over 150 million degrees C, and as of about 2018, the construction cost was <laughs> over 13 billion euros. So we're, it's, um, it's been a little bit of a pricey experiment, but we're still working on it. So here's a, a quick schematic of like how complex the actual device is. And if you look just in this interior where you see like your little cross section and kind of looks like a D here, that's where the actual uh, plasma and hopefully fusion reaction is actually going to be contained. So the total volume of the device uh, where we're actually going to be having the reaction is quite small compared to the total size. Um, for this is an example of one of the magnetic coils that's being will be used to confine um, confine the plasma. Um, so if you look uh, just for some reference, like um, in maybe in that like bottom left hand corner, you see like what looks like um, a, a little like a trolley sort of thing. These the um, I don't know if there's a person somewhere for size, but these things are very uh, very large. This is a couple like a couple stories high. So just from if we look back at like this the schematic here it's if we're talking a, a confinement vessel that is going to be several meters high you can imagine if we're um you need several thousand kilometers of magnetic coil something that they're always looking forward to looking to do is see if there's a way we can ever make these smaller um, it's just revolving around the general concept of modularity which is you know has been um 
uh, explored for not just nuclear fusion, but also nuclear fission reactions, um, basically figuring out a way where we can make these reactors smaller, maybe make them a little bit easier to construct, make them quicker to get implemented and on the grid so that we have a little bit more distributed generation of electricity. So one thing that has made a significant breakthrough in the field of nuclear fusion has been super, superconducting magnets or REVCO. And superconducting magnets have enabled us to very easily increase the strength of the magnetic field by a factor of two, which means that we can reduce the size of every reactor by over a factor of 10. Um, so if you look at this little equation here, the Q um, is proportional to R cubed B to the fifth. So if we're looking at our energy gain factor, so that's the power output we're getting for the power input um, is strongly correlated to the size and the field strength. So every little bit we, that we can increase our field strength for the same power out, we can significantly decrease our size. Um, and also associated with that would be decreasing the cost of doing that construction. So we can go from something like $200 million per megawatt generated to five to $10 per megawatt generated. It's a significant uh, decrease in cost associated with it. So you can see from this uh, little picture here, you go from our old superconducting magnets down to what we're hoping to be able to do with some of our newer superconductor magnets. It's quite quite a bit smaller. Um, this research has been produced by um, Dennis White and his team out of MIT. Actually, this picture here that I pulled out was actually out of an InnoTherm talk that they gave a couple months ago. Um, I've got the YouTube link uh, right here and I can put that in the chat as well if anyone is interested. It's about an hour long, it's extremely interesting. Um, just briefly, uh, going into my PhD research, I worked on the prototype plat material plasma exposure experiment or proto MPEX. Here's a very easy schematic of it here. But what's really important about this device as it relates to nuclear fusion is what's called, um, um, oh my goodness, this thing is jumping all over the place. I apologize. Um, is called uh, plasma material interactions, um, which is basically the, where you figure you're taking the sun you're putting it in a box on Earth and telling it to do exactly what we want it to. That's basically the concept of nuclear fusion. So if you, you figure out how hot the sun actually gets, we don't actually have that many materials on Earth that could re withstand that kind of heat. So we have to do quite a bit of studying with those plasma material interactions. Um, and in theory, we are trying to, on this specific device, create heat fluxes of over 10 megawatts per meter squared. And that's what this specific device was designed to do. And it, um, so if we're, we're working on these very, very high heat loads, um, it's a very critical research area. So that's where proto MPEX could help us. So uh, proto MPEX, this is another schematic. I'm just showing you some very quick uh, important components like the end plates at either end. The fuel, um, one of the fuel sources is called, we use a helicon antenna. So basically the, um, let's see if I can, uh, I'll just m mention it. So the, the helicon antenna, so like if where we, we see that about halfway through the slide, that's where the uh, plasma is actually generated. So where we're, we're creating our, our fuel source and it is being launched in either direction towards the, the target plate and the dump plate here. So um my research revolved around looking at these end plates. So one of you see here is the, the back of the dump plate. Um, we've etched grids in, so we have a better idea of the pattern and, and where the plasma is actually hitting. And then we also went through several series of target plates of different materials, different thicknesses, different sizes. Um, we put different diagnostics on them, like uh, uh, diagnostics that can measure temperature that are thought called thermocouples, among others. And yes? If I may, um, we've got about two more minutes uh, okay, before well, we get into Q and A. So I just want to okay, give you a little um, time. Just more. very briefly, here's a, a quick schematic of um, plasma hitting that target plate, and you can you can see where it's like basically glowing. That's the type of material damage that we need to know and uh, figure out how to avoid, and see what kind of material um, uh, damage can happen. Uh, so I'll just kind of skip through the rest of that. Well, that's. <laughs> I'll just go to extras. Um, but yeah, I can, I'll just go ahead and end right there. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I just love hearing it's like the science fiction of yesterday is today's science.